All right, so to publish onto Azure, you basically right click and click publish. It can't get easier than that, <laughs> right? Um, when you're in here, you have the option to pick uh, the publishing you want to do right now. It's publishing out to this sample function app that I've created, but I'm gonna create a whole brand new one so we can see the walkthrough. First step is you pick where you wanna publish. Azure functions can be published to folders. Um, they can be published directly to Docker containers. Um, on Azure, or you can publish them onto the Microsoft Cloud. In fact, this Docker container registry would publish it, I believe, onto a Docker container that could be anywhere in the world, right? It does not right. have to be um, Azure related, right? Yeah, it does. It publishes it to a Docker Hub, which is available through an API. And you can pull that into any application. Yeah. So it's actually quite amazing. Right. So then once you get past that, you have a choice of where you want your function um, to be, what you want to host your function. So you can actually host functions as Windows, as Linux, um, as, as an app container, which would basically host the function inside of um, Docker, a Docker uh, image, or um, host it um, on the container registry. In this case, to keep it simple, I'm going to host it on Windows. And then over here is where you pick the resource where you want it to be located. So I'm going to click that I want to create a new resource. I want to call it Echo. And I'm going to pick a resource group, which we talked about previously, Cloud Shell Storage. Right. For a plan type, I'm going to pick um, app service plan. Actually, I'm just going to keep it as consumption. Um, for a location, this is what data center this is going to be hosted at, what Azure data center. I will pick um, central US because uh, there was an outage in East US, so I'm mad at East US right now. And the, um, the, the, the plan type, which is the consumption, can we um, talk a little bit about that? So a consumption plan versus a, uh, what are the options that we have there? I think um, we have so a consumption plan versus yeah. a premium plan versus an app service plan. Um, how, what, the, what do we understand the differences are in terms of what is makes sense to use in terms of financing? So, I mean, consumption plan from what I understand and, uh, do we have uses that it allows you to use it on demand? So if you have if, if you have a uh, function that you want to use between nine and ten, <clears throat> you spin up between nine and ten, and it goes down. You only charge for the consumption. Um, and the premium plan is more of the expensive plan. It's almost like a dedicated solution which allows you to have a premium plan out there. You get charged per month, irrespective of whether you're using it or not. And app service plan is basically a container. Uh, which will be set up ahead of time. So if you have an app service plan, you can have an app service plan, you can go with a basic, a standard or a premium, and it gives you three options as well. And then you can deploy as many Azure functions inside, inside of the app service plan, but you're charged on a monthly basis for the um, app service plan. They do have a basic tier, which is actually cheap or technically is free uh, that we can you can leverage if you don't want to use the consumption plan. Yeah, um, that's absolutely right. One of the, the, the one of the key differences is that for some of these plans, your capabilities change. So on the consumption plan, and this might be getting too technical, but you're very much in a uh, uh, platform as a service world, um, and you're just out there for the world. <laughs> you know, your services are open. Right. Um, premium allows you to do to use private links um, to basically. Um, sort of like um, put your services inside of your own um, network. And app service plan is a nice flexible uh, medium ground between the two. I think you you can kind of use it like a consumption plan to a certain extent, you know, uh, you mentioned the free tier, but when you scale up to that super expensive one, then you're, you know, you're again, sort of like thinking about it, like how an enterprise would think about it. <clears throat> And then on the storage side, this is for logging, right? So storage basically allows, it basically provides a location where you're essentially gonna store your files, uh, your log files and things of that nature. So I'm gonna create a new one. I'm gonna make it locally redundant. 
even though I haven't learned my lesson. <laughs> the redundant is basically the other. I think we have an option that we select the drop down. Yes. And I believe geo redundance allows you, and it says that it allows you the region. So you have a a write primary and a read redundant. So if your write goes down, you can actually pull data from your read redundant storage. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The cheapest one is this. And um, I think that's the most expensive one, the global one. Yeah, the global redundant, yeah, yeah storage is, is expensive. Uh, Okay, so this allows us to now create our function, the echo host. <clears throat> so for whatever reason, the process of creating um, Azure functions um, is it's twofold when you've never done it before. And this none of this is how you would actually do it in the real world. And maybe in another video, we can talk about um, DevOps and how these things get actually published. Um, this is more like pretty much this is for like testing purposes, I would say, um, uh, you know, I, we, I never see anybody really deploy from Visual Studio in the real world, <laughs> you know, right, it's true. Yeah. But basically, when you use Visual Studio to deploy a brand new function app, you first have to create the function app. And then after you create it, then you got to go back and now actually publish to the thing that you've created. Um, so while this is taking uh, its time, do you want to talk a little bit about um, some of the, some of the technologies and things that you've um, uh, that you've you've done in the past? Like I know you have a product, uh, uh, you know, that does uh, cloud-based uh, messaging and things of that nature. Do you want to? <clears throat> yeah. So uh, so basically, uh, um, one of the um, platforms that we're actually looking at right here, which is uh, Function Apps, is uh, one of the um, candidates that would fit into some of the solutions that are presented. We know that building APIs today is is very difficult, I mean, and can be challenging and time consuming. So um, over the years of um, gathering some knowledge, I'm, I'm coming from a development platform world. I understand that it makes it easier for us to actually be able to deploy a lot of these APIs much quicker into the cloud so the clients can start getting some real good feedback or return on investment on any um, product that they're trying to get into the cloud. So I built a um, Nougat package, uh, which is called Zenhey, which an X is X-E-N-H-E-Y. Is available out there inside of um, Nougat and it enables you to quickly build APIs and leverage a lot of the resources in the cloud. So a good example, if you want to use a cheap solution where you want to create a database, you might decide to go with an Azure table storage. Uh, if you want to just store your files into a repository somewhere so you can later on, later on come and get them, you can use something like a storage account. We kind of talked about it already. Uh, that capability is there. And also things like the old school RMDB database like SQL, you can use that. And you can also use some eventing technology like an event hub. Uh, also, you can use some messaging technology like service service bus, which allows you to put things onto a message, write it through, um, uh, through queues or topics. That's a very big um, use case for a lot of um, businesses that use service buses. And event hubs are basically a big aggregation um, um, a resource that is used to collect a large amount of data and you can push it out to any backend system. And also all the things that are supported with this um, Nugget package is the capability to do use things like third-party products like um, SendGrid or Mailgun. And also I've introduced recently the capability to use Twilio to send text messages to your actual phones. So you can actually use that functionality. And the last one, which um, a lot of people may or may not be familiar with, is using something like Slack to get notifications sent out through API. So if you guys go out there to use NHA, um, you, we, we can, I can provide some startup um, configuration files that allows you to, you can start up and um, build a function inside of a day. You can actually have a RESTful API that you can actually use within your company instead of one day. Okay, we'll have so, links below to actually get out to those sites. Yeah, I, I'm going to include the links. Um, it's called Zen, Zen Hey, spelled X-E-N-H-E-Y, correct? Correct, yes. Okay. Okay, so, and, you know, in a future video, maybe we'll do a walkthrough um, of that and show people um, the power and flexibility of it. I've, I've used it, and it's, it's just amazing how well it works. <laughs> We'll have a follow-up video at uh, I don't know when, but we will have a follow-up video that will cover um, similar to what 
um, Edward is showing you, but we're going to build a real application that can actually collect real data um, from a client and store it into a database. And we can do such that will bring some data back. Uh, then you can then we'll have additional information and also all the code is available so you guys can actually practice and give us some feedback on what you think when you use it within your industry. Okay, so the last thing we're going to do here before publishing is we're going to enable application insights so application insights is a way um, to um, to basically connect your application into the Azure logging infrastructure. Would you say that's correct, Obi? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, and also what it does is that it, logging is just uh, does a basic functionality of what it does. You know, I mean, there's a lot of tools out there today. You might be saying to yourself, why can I use that uh, log for net or maybe use Splunk or some other tools rather than using App Insight. And that's, that. I get a lot of those questions, but one of the things that Application Insights offers is uh, alerting for any time your application is down it, you can do real-time um, uh, analytics in terms of understanding how your application is behaving and how often you're making all these backend calls. And you can actually set up alerts in place to understand if I'm making five or six calls. And some people actually use it for uh, anal analysis and data science. They can actually understand the application's behavior by using application insights to give feedback back to their business units so they can make some adjustments to the API to accommodate for all the changes that they're looking at. So it, there's a lot of good stuff in there. We're gonna show some graphs inside of Application Insights to show what, it, what the benefits are once we get this published into the cloud. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's create a, an Application Insights instance for this application. So all I had to do is once the application was created, I scroll down and don't publish yet scroll down and in here you can add other service dependencies um, as you can see the cloud storage account echo host storage has already been added and configured um, so we can click in here and actually add um, uh, an app insights account so we'll call it echo storage insights okay. we'll make sure it's in the same resource group um, and in the same region and then we click create. There we go. And then we simply select it. Um, and that's it. So as you can see, ultimately what this does is it adds um, settings uh, to your application, right? Um, that basically enable uh, the logging capabilities. And then there's more things that you can actually add as service dependencies. Um, uh, application Insights is one of them. As you can see, you can add Signalar, uh, you can add SQL Server, and I think all these dependencies, when you add them, they sort of like function together as one on the cloud, right? Right. Okay. So we're all set with the application, and we are now going to publish it. So we can now go ahead and go to Azure, go to our resource group, and we should see our service there and sure enough there it is echo service and i should be able to hit that service i'm going to copy that and i'm going to do the same thing so as you can see it's called echo host websites.net name equals john smith Oh, I think I missed something. I think you missed the, um, if you go back to the actual code base, you, I think you missed the, the um, URL. You go to the monitor tab, you go into the function. And I'll show you how to grab, go to the function itself and you can get a URL. Oh, there. I don't have the URL for the function. Yeah. Yeah. So you get, if you go click on the echo service. Yeah. And yeah. this is actually a very good trick um, if you're not sure what the URL representation means. And if you go to code and test, 
or you can click up there it's a get function url that's another way to get it if you click that guy you copy it yeah there you go then, then that's a quick another way to actually um, obtain the function in case you make mistakes like what ed just did right yeah now. <laughs> there we go yeah and that takes you straight there right and if you go back to azure we can just talk briefly about that window so this window here is actually very interesting is um a place where you can do a lot of things you could do inline code testing so if you went into code and test in there uh you can actually perform the same task or the, the same functionality that we're doing within the browser uh if you, cl if you scroll to the right side of there actually hit the test and run button at the top there uh, you can actually do http get and then you can you can add you can add a parameter in there which is basically the um, name or key name is um, name and you put a name in there and you put a value in there and you can hit the run button you don't have to provide the url the url is intrinsic there you go and that performs exactly the same thing so for, for uh, people that don't want to use the ui and want to do post tests and don't have a fancy tool like postman you can actually come in here and actually do quick tests and that will actually do a couple of things. It will actually um, show you your logs that come out on the left side. Although the window doesn't um, reflect that right now, but you could see the logs um, on the left side as you make every call. So it captures the logs in real time, which is actually one of the benefits of <clears throat> running it inside of code and test. And the other piece, which is the monitor, which is actually a very good tool, actually takes all, all the goodnesses that we had on the local host testing. Um, if you click configure that, I think we may not have captured that yet. Uh, it should just allow you to associate with a, um, you do the association there, that's good. Yeah, you just have to click the association, then click okay. Then you're set inside of um, the function app. Then that will start capturing additional um, data once we start sending information through the RESTful API. And then you can actually look at the information here once that's up and running. That takes a while to set up. It takes about five minutes to completely to get up and running. Yep. Yeah. So um, now if you start sending um, data across in the next five minutes, you will start seeing some additional information here. And that's very useful when you're trying to understand the behavior of your application in terms of you have failures or you have false successes, meaning that you're getting responses back that you don't know about. It provides a, what we call a uh, uh, invocation ID or in this case, an operation ID, which allows you to track it inside application insights to find out what is going on within your application, especially if you have dependencies that you're communicating with like um, storage accounts or uh, SQL databases to provide all those dependencies as well. Okay, so now that we have our application running, mm -hmm. um, how do we go about, um, right? Cause that's the, that's the key thing here. The key thing um, is how- I know that I can go into um, that I can go into log stream as an example, right. um, and that, that connects. And then when I go here and I actually, oops, when I go here and I enter some of these values, like Jacob, I can see those values reflected very similar to what happened um, on my desktop. Um, when I ran it locally. But what I want to do now is I want to add that comprehensive logging to the application so that I can tell when, for instance, I pass in a number and it crashes. I'd like to know that it's crashed and I'd like for my, you know, my DevOps people and my networking and infrastructure people who keep my echo service running to be made aware so they can fix whatever issues um, there are. So how would I go about doing that? Yeah, so there's a couple of ways of doing that. The first and the most easiest way is to go through the uh, metrics and build a rule that indicates what you're looking for. That's the first way of doing it. So if you click in the metrics area, okay, and you have a bunch of options on the right side of you, which, which is there, you can do a memory, you can use response time, you can use file in and out. And one of the things that are all the different type of um, HTTP errors that you can target. So you can do four ones, four threes, four fours, which is obviously page not found. And then you can have server errors, which we scroll down a little bit further. You can capture some of the server errors. 
that uh, goes from the less than 500s to over less than 600s. I think you clicked on it too fast. We're just going to show you what that's over there. So I click on it again one more time. Uh, you, or you probably hover it, hover over it for a second. Okay. It tells you the, the count of requests, um, HTTP service codes as greater or equals to 500, but less than equals to 600. So we found that earlier we were receiving a 500 error. So that will fall in that category. And then what you can do is that if you want to see how your 500 errors are showing up there, you can actually run it in here in real time. And when you're happy with it, you can create what they call a new alert rule that will tie that in. Then you can start putting some um, messaging around it. You can put an email around it. Uh, you can put SMS around it once you're comfortable with the actual uh, metrics which you've generated here. So we can start here and actually generate some 500s and then we see it appear here. So if we click on that one, uh, okay. right now nothing's gonna show up because you just set it up. Um, but once you start sending messages in, I think it, it takes about five minutes or so to come up here or or every minute, I forget, but um, I think it's either one to five minutes is, is really where you will see those errors showing up inside of there. And it's much more responsive here because you're within the context of the application versus when you're doing it through application insights. Okay, so I'm generating these errors right now. And what right. I'm gonna do in Postman is I'm actually going to save this. And then we're gonna use one of the features which are really cool, which is called a um, runner. It's almost like um, JMeter or if you're using any of the tools that allow you to do automation, you can actually do a kind of a PT test type setup where you're, you can set up a runner to repeat a certain call over a period of time. And then you can generate some load inside of your Azure function. We can put like maybe a hundred delays off. We can put a delay of maybe, you can put, yeah, and put a delay of maybe um, 30 seconds in between calls. Well, that's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We do 30 seconds. Yeah, now we can just keep to keep sending <clears throat> messages to the back end every 30 seconds, for 200 times. And then we can get some real time telemetry. So if we hit the run button, that should actually start running. And then okay. we can go back into, we can just focus now on the metrics instead of Azure that I keep running. Okay. Uh, so we should see that soon. I mean, you can keep hitting the refresh button at the top there. I was just going to ask, does, is this a real time refresh or does it use it? We already, it looks like we got one. We got a date already. So if you see, if you look at, if you look at the right side, yeah. So that answers that question, right? So now we have real time HTTP errors. You can drill down by clicking it on it, or you can hover over it, uh, click and drag. Yeah, there you go. And then you, that will drill down and then it will give you down to the minutes when this is happening. And the good news about this setup is that if you just leave it as is, every one minute to refresh itself and start capturing additional errors that have, been, that have come in in that period of time. So you have a nice graph telling you when you receive 500 errors coming in through um, using telemetry this way. And once you're comfortable, once you're comfortable with the actual way the data is coming in, and you know you're happy with it, then you can add a new alert rule to that actual um, um, piece of. Uh, the actual alert that you set up, and then you can tie in some emails and tie in some SMS after that. So would I click this right here? Yeah, so you click new rule, and what new rule does is that it recognizes that you've actually created an alert that ties into that here. And you, you see what it says? It says uh, when the sum of the HTTP errors is greater than, if you click that guy, it, it tries to help you, but you probably have to fill in one or two pieces of information in there. So, and then it gives you a real time graph of the, the let that you say, then this is where we were um, looking at, where we're looking at the threshold value. So, threshold values are very interesting, right? The way it works is that you have to determine if you get errors that are more than two, it to throw, it to give you an excited to throw, it to send an alert out. And then the other piece, which means the aggregation granularity, means that how often is I'm making, how far back am I gonna go based on the time period? So in this case, what we're doing is that it's gonna check every five minutes and it's gonna run as frequently as one minute. So every one minute is gonna go five minutes back. Every one, one minute is gonna go five minutes back. So that's the frequency in which is gonna run to check in the last five minute window or what is any exceptions that happen, but it's gonna only trigger when there's two exceptions that happen inside of five minutes when it runs every minute. So that's how well, that's set up right now. What is the significant between aggregation type? 
So for example, if I picked count, how is that different from if I- Well, the, 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 count, the, the count represents when you have two, a count of two. That's okay. the, the, the threshold value is the count of two. So I have to get to two each time it starts up. Okay. It's not, it's not cumulative. The okay. count is more like, oh, I'll go count one or I start up again and I've got count two. If it starts up in a minute, you have to have a maximum of two in that window. You can't have a maximum of one. But in the, in this, in the sense of the count, it will wake up and say, oh, I've got one. I wake up again in a minute, I have two. Then it will give you an exception when you use the count. Okay. So you're better off using a count because the count is much more uh, fine-tuned in the sense that every time it wakes up every minute, if it sees one, if it, if it wakes up every minute and it looks at five minutes and it sees two entries in there, you just get you just get an exception that's sent out. So in this scenario where I have total, mm -hmm. this so could, it, this could give false positives after a while, right? It will give false positives because you're getting a total amount of exceptions inside of five of minutes. That period to, of time. Wait, it has to be two. Yeah. It has to be greater than or equals to two. But in the case of counts, it, if it fires up the first time and it only sees one, it won't, it will wait till it receives two. Then once it gets to two, it will send the exception out. Not every time that it counts, it starts up, it always has to expect two. So in this case, it's more, it's much better to do it this way. So, so the, so to sum, if, if I, if I could summarize that, I could say that when you use count every single time, the, uh, every single time that an alert is triggered it resets it resets everything whereas when it, what it does is it checks it, it checks easy. for your yeah it resets it checks how many um exceptions you have at that point in time so if you say yeah. you want count in, in my case if i was to do this and i want to be very uh i want to be very granular and, and make sure that i don't get any exceptions i would say when well, my count is greater than zero so the first okay. exception i hit i get a lot sent out yeah. Well, if you, if you don't want to be very particular, if you have a site that, that is, has a lot of exceptions, you might want to set either your total counts in a given window to a certain number. Okay. So every time it starts up, it's going to go back five minutes and say, hey, uh, if I have 10, if my, if my threshold is 10, I'm going to wait till I get to 10. But if I'm at nine, when I start off in the last five minutes, I'm going to try an error. And if I start another minute, I have to go back five minutes and I have to add, add up to 10 all the time. And that's what the um, count is. So for now, if you have that set up now um, and you are done and you're comfortable with it. By the way, we're at two. You are two, yeah. So just click done. So you click done and that will, that will set up your condition. So now your conditions is all set up. So now you have your conditions set up. Um, obviously note there that you get charged 10 cents a month, which is a small amount to pay.